So good evening, everyone. And what is today? Today is September the 16th. And when the story is told, it would be said that in on September the 16th, 2021, a different bookless cultural center, the People's Residence, <clears throat> once again hosted a man that you have to say all his names. Never one name, <laughs> never two, but all three together. And that would be our great author and writer, George Eliot Clark. And I know that you're thinking, oh my gosh, do I have his latest book? Oh my gosh, listen, don't beat up yourself. You know that you can uh, get a copy of his book at a different book list and all the fine bookstores right across this great country of Canada. And I want to thank Penguin Random House <clears throat> Canada for all their efforts to Shona Cook to publicist for all the great work. And I would be amiss if I didn't also thank our literary coordinator, none other than the fabulous Neil Armstrong. But to get us started, to get us started tonight, I am now going to read the land acknowledgement. <clears throat> A different bookless cultural center, the People's Residence and its supporters, acknowledge the original caretakers and storytellers of this land. The Mississaugas of the Credit, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Métis, and the Wendat First Nations. We thank these mighty nations for allowing us to build our families, homes, and dreams in this land. We pledge to walk hand in hand with them as we journey towards a better world of self-determination and social justice. And I'm going to say, ashe. And for all of you two who are watching this broadcast tonight, you notice I said broadcast, broadcast tonight. For all of you who are watching this broadcast tonight, yes, we do have in the people's residence the miniest, the smallest, a tiny, tiny audience. And as we go forward, we are going to liberate the doors of 7, yes, 7, 7 Bathurst Street to you. And you're going to come in threes because when we come in threes, we are in agreement. And maybe we, we may liberate it a little bit further. We're going to have five. So when you come through the door, we can bunks five times or we may even be able to do a high five. So tonight, I also, too, want to welcome all of those who really talk hard of us, who gave us their wills, who promised us their children and their grandchildren's wealth to be in the people's residence tonight. Oh, you should see them rolling up at like 5 o'clock. People are rolling up in a line and say, we will give you all our money if you let us in. You know, I felt so bad taking their money. You know, I thought, oh, my God, I hope it's not in like a currency from the developing world or something like this, so I can't go far with it. But but in seriousness, I want to thank all our viewers here who are in the center tonight, who are giving us that human energy and that human contact. So as authors and writers, we can vibe off of them. Now, you know, when you speak with George Elliott Clark, wow, this is a man who is like Ontario Hydro. He can just light up the world. When I first met him, I thought, no, push back. You cannot have more energy than me. This is impossible. <laughs> But whenever he comes into a room, and when you see people, you see their spirits first. So when we see his spirit, we see a spirit with joy, a spirit that says, I am here, I am present, take me on, because I'm here to take the world on. And as you know, George has written extensively, 17 collections of poetry, and I'm sure on the way here this afternoon, if it was even on a napkin, he crafted a poem about coming back to the people's residence here on the beautiful street called Bathurst. Two novels, The Motorcyclist, George and Rue, Wild of Falls, Portia White, A Portrait in Words, Four Works of Drama, and the list goes on and on and on. And I dare not mention a Governor General's awardee, Poet Laureate of the City of Toronto, Parliamentary Poet. Oh my gosh, the list goes on. But we are here tonight to talk about something that is equally dear to his heart. He has given birth to a new chapter in another book in Canadian history, Where Beauty Survived. I 
I'm so happy that he's launching this book with us tonight because he knows that every day I survive beauty and that I'm beautiful. So this is so wonderful, George, <laughs> that you are here tonight basking in my beauty. At one point in time, I lost my airing audience. I just got to tell you all the business, and I couldn't find it. And suddenly, oh, I had an idea. The folks who were sitting with behind me just sent some creativity my way. And so I was able to fix my earring, and I, too, I'm in a place where beauty survived. Are you feeling me? Are you with me? <laughs> We're going to have a wonderful night. And so, George, welcome. Oh, welcome, I, welcome, welcome. I, uh, it is such a great pleasure to be here. Yes, and it is good, too, as that we are in this recovery period of COVID. And again, uh, for people to come out, for people to be in the company with each other and to speak to you on Zoom, oh, my gosh, that wouldn't be possible, you know. We'd be, like, looking forward and, and doing all of that, my brother, you know. So it is good that we're here. I remember when Susan Cole of Now Magazine called some years ago um, after the transition of the other Clark, the great Austin Clark. And the question she asked at that time was, Ida, <clears throat> what do you think about African-Canadian literature? Well, what do you think about in the light of tr Clark's transition? And, and I said to her, it's going to be big. It's going to be huge. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have an explosion of writers. And she said, why would you say that? And I say to her, because I see people uh, independently publishing people who have a narrative and a voice, who have something to say and can do that well, and they have sought self-determination, and they decided if a major publisher doesn't pick me up, I am going to document, and I'm going to get it into the hands of the people, following a little bit the hip-hop formula and, and what the hip-hop movement did. And so today, George, you must be equally pleased as we celebrate, too, with you another crop of new writers, and by the way, I tell you, George, they're making some big money, too. <laughs> so, uh, so when we say Kinesia Lubrin, yeah. I I isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. uh, Nadia Hahn just slammed down the other day with that incredible print run with a TD Bank b p uh, placing her book in the hands of grade one children. Oh. Right, uh, David Cherry Andy, Ian Williams, all these people just blowing it up in, in, in this country. What are your thoughts on this explosion of writers and, 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 and our celebration of them? It's a moment that has been coming for decades and spearheaded, of course, by Austin and, and I think also inspired by uh, the uh, movement by many. Uh, to basically seize for themselves, as you were saying a moment ago, uh, the means of production to get their works out there, uh, to produce the records and to produce the videos and, and get the poetry books out there. And also, uh, I think of someone like Dwayne Morgan, for instance, mm -hmm. and, and uh, putting together all of his projects of spoken <coughs> word, uh, celebration and excitement, and basically making it possible for uh, young black uh, uh uh, persons to understand that it is not impossible for them to express themselves and to seize the freedom to do that, mm -hmm. to exercise uh, the freedom of speech that we supposedly have, mm -hmm. and to document our stories, document our lives, document our realities, talk about our love stories, talk about our histories, talk about our politics, talk about our faiths, our religion. Uh, religions, plural, and understand that it's all of it is central to demonstrating our awesome humanity. So this moment of many writers coming to voice, many black writers coming to voice, mm -hmm. is the fruition of a lot of the work that people like Austin uh, spearheaded beginning in 1964 mm -hmm. when he published his first novel. Mm -hmm. And for most of his career, people thought that he was the first black Canadian novelist. He wasn't, but everybody thought he was, and he thought he was. And the, but the important point about all that is that, for all intents and purposes, he was the first and set the standard, was the role model, was up there shining that, that light upon everybody. He was that beacon to say that you, too, have a story that's worth telling. You, too, can have your name <coughs> on the spine of a book mm -hmm. and available to others to understand better our reality our history, our survival, our, our own celebrations individually of the survival of beauty 
no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I also, too, got to give props, too, to Zalika Reed Benta. Yes. Uh, and, and, you know, as, as Eglinton West is going through its redevelopment, and, and, and here Zalika came back uh, and, and, and brought Eglinton West and, and the stories of Eglinton West and that business community into our consciousness. And, of course, people like J.L. Richardson, Shante Grant, your homegirl, big up, big up, big up <laughs> to all of them and this wonderful yeah. crop of writers. So tell me, George, where beauty survived? Why now? Why this book? Um, why the title? And what propelled you to write it this time, this particular, and I'd like to say, coming-of-age memoir? Well, yeah, I, uh, that's what it is. It is a coming-of-age memoir. Uh, and I have two <coughs> reasons for wanting to write it. The first is simply that I had a contract. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's honest. That, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. Okay, had a contract with the right. You know, that, that kind of thing. I'm sorry to like just name it that way, but that's true. You know, uh, Knopf very kindly uh, offered me a contract and and uh, enough time uh, to allow me to get it done. So that was the the first catalyst for doing it. I'm not sure I would have written uh, a memoir otherwise per se. At the same time, that's true. I also realized that there is something. I hope important about my story because it's not only my story. It's the story about my community, the people I call Africadians, uh, the Black Nova Scotians, African Nova Scotians. And what is distinctive about us? What's distinctive about our community? Communities. Well, it's the fact that uh, in the struggle against slavery, in escaping slavery, in seeking refuge, and and finding a degree of of refuge and liberty in colonial Nova Scotia. Uh, despite the fact we were not welcome, despite the fact that our, our ancestors were settled on the poorest land possible deliberately to force them to become uh, a pool of cheap labor for 200 years. That was a deliberate policy of the colonial government. And of course that caused a great deal of poverty, illiteracy, uh, disease, uh, uh, illness, uh, police persecution, uh, and so on. Uh, and because the policy of the colonial government was basically, we want you to leave. But if you're going to stay in Nova Scotia, then you're just going to be cheap labor forever. You and your children, your grandchildren, forever and forever and forever. Mm -hmm. If you choose to stay here, that's what we have to offer you. Uh, but the beautiful thing about uh, those ancestors, despite the struggle and despite the challenges that they had, they decided to stay. They decided to put up their homes. If other people wanted to call them shacks or call them huts or whatever, fine. But for them, they were homes. Um, even though they were given the worst possible land, they still managed to put together little gardens. They still managed to get themselves a cow, a couple chickens, a hog. I like to say it that way. A hog. <laughs> right? And, and start putting together... A piggy bank. A, a piggy <laughs> bank. Right? And start putting together the rudiments of a community. Right? Yes. I mean, Here's the ingenious of the people. And I believe you, call, you talk about the cultural centers being the people's residence. Mm -hmm. I believe in the ingenuity of the people writ large. And that whenever there are oppressive circumstances, the people always find a way to get around them, to survive them, and do as much as they can with what they have. And that's certainly the story of, the, of, the, of my ancestors, the early African Nova Scotians, and so on, despite all the pressures on, on them to get them to leave. They said, no, we, we love the fact that we have a place to call our own. We love the fact that we can finally raise our children as our children and so on, without fear of them being seized and stolen away and sold away and never to be seen again and so on. So for those first generations escaping slavery, for those first generations tasting freedom, the fact they had a scraggly plot of land and only enough materials to put up a shack uh, and so on, did not dissuade them from deciding that they were that they were in Shangri-La, that they were in Canaan. Why? Because they had the ability to hold their spouses. They had the ability to keep their children together, to have their children asleep under their own roof. A dream come true, for crying out loud, no matter how desperate situations may have been. And then, and then to undertake the project of creating beauty, to have flowers along with the potatoes, all right? To have, to have lettuce along with the, the carrots uh, and, and sunflowers along with the tomatoes and, and some whatever it was they could grow 
uh, and to make their beer and make their apple wine and make their pear wine and have their shin dicks and have people <laughs> beating spoons on their knees and so on and people getting fiddles. One of the things I have to say, you know, I had to write an introduction to uh, uh, Robin Wink's The Blacks in Canada mm -hmm. History. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a great history, but of course, extremely flawed in the interpretation of, of mm -hmm. what people had to do. And one of the arguments I, I make back to Wink's about his depiction of, of historical black Canada as being a bunch of failures was that, was that mm. no, people found ways to, to create, uh, to, to add beauty to their lives. And so uh, when the colonial government gave them poor land, they said, we want more poor land. And of course, the colonial government was saying, oh, you're, you're ridiculous people. You want more poor land. Okay, here, we're going to give you some more poor land. What, they, what the colonial government did not understand was that people were creating communities. They were creating communities. And then those communities were anchored by a church that the people put up themselves. And then for the hell of it, stuck stained glass windows in them. <laughs> I love that. I love the fact that, that one of the early church leaders who happened to be white, who was from Wales, was very popular. He married into the community, married a black woman, was was part of the community, and so on. Unfortunately, uh, uh, this gentleman, uh, uh, Thomas Burton, uh, caught a cold, a pneumonia, and, and died at a very young age, 28 or so. And then the people decided to make him a saint. I love that. <laughs> in fact, you go to North Preston, the largest black community in Canada, you go to North Preston, you're going to see St. Thomas United Baptist Church. <laughs> and, you're, and you'll be mistaken to think, oh, they're talking about uh, St. Thomas of this or St. Thomas. No, they're talking about uh, Thomas Burton. Uh, and the fact that the people just admired him so much is that he's a saint. You know, okay. and, and they just said, oh, you're a saint. Uh, no problem. Right? So. Uh, one of the things, too, that caught my imagination picture books and the role of picture books really shape and inform our lives. And oftentimes, and, and I celebrate Shante Grant and Eva Campbell in their book, Africville, mm -hmm. for, for, for again, for precisely uh, illustrating what you have just described. Families, communities, doing ordinary things, happy things, everyday things, great lives. But one of the things about picture book, oftentimes, when we present black people, African people, we are in the rural Areas and it's always bad. It's always hard. We work real hard. We're, we're often never presented in urban settings. You know, like there are no cities in Nigeria or in Barbados or places around the world. And and then when I also read your book, what made me think of the voices of Jamaicans? When Jamaicans say, "I went to boarding school in Kingston, but I was from the country, and I couldn't wait to get back home." You know, in the summertime, and when they say that. Their backs get straighter. Mm -hmm. They begin to smile. Their eyes pick up. So here it is. You have described for us this rural area, this rural community, where whenever you entered it, you felt like a prince coming from the city. That's fascinating. Um, and, and also to what, what is fascinating for me is the comparison or the parallels that you are making about this rich life in a rural setting. And you were reading the same stories or the likeness of them mm -hmm. in the books that were presented at that time in children's literature where the characters themselves were almost all white. Uh, was that intentional to do that, that sexiness, that <laughs> upliftment of the rural community rather than the urban community? Where were you going with that? Oh, my golly. Aita, that's a, that's a great question. I want to come back to the picture books because, of course, for children... Um, uh, as we learn to read and so on, those illustrated books really feed our imaginations and really mm -hmm. tell us about the possibilities, the magic mm -hmm. that might be there in mm -hmm. the larger world. Mm -hmm. If only our parents could see it. Mm -hmm. It's one of the great strengths of being kids, one of the mm -hmm. great strengths of children is that they believe in magic. They know magic is there. Uh, it's, it's you made, miracles, not a problem. You made that rural community very magical. Oh, yeah. It, it's, <laughs> it's like it's everywhere, right, in everything. And it's, and it's easy to celebrate, easy to accept. And then, the, and then the picture books tend to emphasize that, right? Now, of course, the picture books I had in, in primary, uh, Gin and Company readers, they featured <laughs> Tom, Betty, and Susan, and a dog named Flip. <laughs> <laughs> Always, and, and they were like blonde kids, and and uh, there's the dog, and they had a like kind of suburban 
uh, farm, agricultural lifestyle, suburban rural lifestyle. And that might, if I had grown up in Halifax completely and only, that might have seemed alien and alienating to me. But as a boy, I didn't think it was all that strange or weird because I didn't have to go very far, go up to the country, go up home, as you like to say, in Nova Scotia, and we go up to the family home or whatever the homestead, and and uh, and I would have the same kinds of characteristics: there are horses, cowboys, <laughs> chickens, you know, the whole thing, uh, the hazelnut trees and the apple trees and, and and all that. And so I didn't think of myself as, as having an alien kind of existence. I, I saw I saw those picture books actually justifying my childhood and mm. as being a reality that reflected what I what I knew and and uh, and as, as and seeing it as being normal I mean one of my favorite memories from my time as a child and I unfortunately always associated with orange pineapple ice cream is is that I, I still remember clear as day it was probably sundown summer and the sun was shining in the faces of these two gentlemen who were decked out like cowboys, absolutely cowboys, cowboy hats, cowboy boots, and so on, and they were and they were uh, walking these horses up the road, Green Street, in front of my grandparents' place, and the sun shining on their faces because they were uh, part white, part indigenous, part black, made them look like the same color as orange pineapple ice cream. <laughs> you know? and, and so never, in fact, I still order orange pineapple ice cream now. <laughs> Partly just in, in you know in fealty to that memory, but I'm so proud of the fact I came from and come from a place where people of all complexions were part of the black community. People of all complexions were part of the black community, right? And there wasn't any division. The divisions came about when you when you left the community and when you went into the larger community. And of course, you're in Halifax and you're in working class immigrant military household North End Halifax vis-a-vis -vis the upper middle class, upper class South End, right? And so there in Halifax, uh, you definitely were not in utopia. You were in dystopia. Uh, and then in the countryside, it was utopia. But one more thing about that, and it was one of the great things about being uh, African Nova Scotian, Africadian, is that no matter what kinds of loneliness and alienation and even oppression I may ever have felt as a youth, uh, going out in the world, coming to Toronto, coming to Kitchener Waterloo to do my undergraduate uh, degree, and so on. In the back of my mind, I always knew there was this three quarters of an acre of land in Three Mile Plains that was mine, and that it goes back in my family 200 years to the days of, of slavery in colonial Nova Scotia. And, and not only that, but that I had relatives who all lived around that area. And this is bringing me back to what you were saying about people in Jamaica talking about going uh, to the country and uh, from the city and, and finding strength in that. I found the same kind of strength, uh, and I still do, uh, when I go to Three Mile Plains, Five Mile Plains. And i got to say it, I'm, I'm talking too much, but i got to say it. One of the great strengths <laughs> of being from that place is that I can say that I'm from Newport Station. And that it's a real place, and Three Mile Plains, the Five Mile Plains, Windsor Plains, and that this is part of a historical black community in Nova Scotia. Despite all the oppression, people ended up building all these communities, and the churches to anchor them. And some of them had schools, and some of them had stores, and so on. And, and so basically there was this little separate culture that got, that got created despite uh, the <coughs> racism, despite the oppression. And so... Uh, and family names are related to that. So um, I meet somebody whose surname is Day, spelled D-A-Y-E. I know they've got two family seats. They got a family seat down in in Digby County. They got a family seat up in Upper Big Trackety, Lincolnville, Sunnyville. Uh, and same thing for my mom's uh, family name Johnson. Well, that's the, that's Hans County. Uh, and if someone tells me my surname is Cromwell, I say, Oh, you're from Weymouth Falls, mm. right? So it's like. There's, there was a lot of power in that. Oh, and, and, and also to what is sweet throughout the book, too, uh, your reference always to the nicknames or the <laughs> aliases, you, 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 you know, uh, that, that, that sweetens everything. I mean, like, who calls people by their real name, you know, like Uncle Socks and, and on and on this thing goes, you know, that, that it, 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 it very 
black people conversations. So I want to go to Geraldine Elizabeth Clark. Mm -hmm. And I want to get, get the whole, whole name. And William Lloyd Clark. By the way, George, do, do you drive a motorcycle? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been a passenger on a motorcycle. Okay, all right. I thought he might maybe even during COVID that you would have tried, you know, your look at it and think, you know, I could take on this this motorbike and ride around the city because there was no traffic anywhere. So it was a perfect time for you to, uh, to train. But I want to talk now about your parents. When I looked at the pictures of your mother, I saw your face. And, and, and in that moment, I thought of when you walked around the community or places, people say, are you Geraldine's son? What a way you, you have our face on you, you know? <laughs> so so, so that, 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 that came into my mind. And then also, too, when, and your mother and your mother's story um, reminds me of so many women I know. I know your mother. Your mother is an aunt. Mm -hmm. She's in my family. She's in all of our families. And then there's your dad, who for me was like continuing education um, and very cool. When... We think of George Eliot Clark, and George Eliot Clark thinks of himself. What are those characteristics in the modeling of Bill and Jerry that George Eliot Clark carries today wow. as a big man, as a parent? Yes. Oh, my golly. Mm -hmm. there, there, see, now there's another question mm -hmm. that, that is uh, uh, just so front and center, you know, um, and... Uh, I'm going to try not to get emotional here, so I'll try my very best not to be. Um, I'll just say this. Uh, they were two people who should probably never have married. And you did say that? Um, because they were just so different. They were complete opposites. My, my mom looked white uh, as a result of our indigenous heritage mm -hmm. and black heritage and so on, and she did, and, and so on. But... She was entirely black. I mean, in, in every possible way, in her, in her interests, occasionally in her speech, um, uh, certainly in her love of, of music and fashion and dress. Uh, uh, and she cut a swath. I mean, she was the kind of person, and she liked this. I got to tell you the truth. She liked this. She liked walking into a room and having all the women turn their heads and get jealous. And have all the men turn their heads and say, "Mm-hmm." <laughs> she liked that, uh, and and she liked being looked at. She liked uh, being seen as being beautiful, being pretty, uh, and so on. But of course, she had a lot of smarts to go right along mm -hmm. with that because she mm -hmm. was one of the pioneers of early childhood education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a grown man before I really understood how influential my mother was on my own intellectual development. I used to give most of the credit to my father. Uh, because of the fact that as a, as a boy and into my adulthood, I kept wanting to, to try to please him. And I kept wanting him to really like me and really love me in a, in a, in a clear and apparent way. And so for that reason, I kept paying him fealty, saying, yes, he's, he's the one who gave me all this and gave me all that and so on. And that was a, really a disservice to my mom, because she was the one who was home with my two brothers and I mm -hmm. when we were developing. She was the one who got the daycares going, uh, in which, uh, in the first one that she was uh, uh, active in, uh, she had Alexa McDonough, who became the leader mm -hmm. of the Federal New Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Alexa McDonough was my kindergarten teacher, and she worked for my mother, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jerry Clark, uh, uh, born Geraldine Elizabeth Johnson, uh, she had tremendous ideas for how to educate kids, especially underprivileged, marginalized, racialized kids, and, and along with giving us a lot of education, a lot of encouragement to read and to, and to move around to uh, uh, apply Montessori methodology mm. in, in her kindergartens, she also just gave us a lot of love. Uh, I have a quotation in the book that's basically from her where she says that if kids don't feel love at home, they've got to feel it in school. And that's what she wanted to bring to the schools, this idea of love. And to pivot back to my father, now i, I got to say very quickly too, my mom uh, graduated from Teachers College, so she was one of the first black teachers uh, in Nova Scotia. Uh, my father, who was definitely black, no question about it, uh, had European tastes. So here's my mom who looks white, but is very, very soulful. 
-hmm. Here's my dad, who's black, but is very oriented towards European culture um, in, in many ways. And, and, uh, and so together, they gave my brothers and I uh, you know, a bicultural, I gotta say it that way, like a kind of like bicultural uh, upbringing, uh, as I say in, in the book, you know, my mom was like James Brown, and my dad was like, no, you gotta yeah. hear some Beethoven now. That's right, right? Yes. And so there was always like this ricocheting back and forth about what kind of music we're gonna be listening to And today. he was a painter. And he was, and he was a painter, mm -hmm. and, and that really meant a lot Smoking jacket so. kind of painter? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, you know, he was a he was a car table kind of painter okay. because that was our that was our class situation, right? Mm -hmm. Like we were better off than a whole lot of other families. You know, I, I can't say we weren't. We were. I grew up feeling a sense of of almost uh, wealth because uh, my father, as I say in the book, he was like work ethic incarnate. Mm -hmm. So when my mom was home with us. He was working two or three jobs mm -hmm. all the time, all the time, mm -hmm. right? And so we never never felt like we were wanting for anything uh, except for the fact that he was not so keen on us having new clothes or mm -hmm. new shoes because he grew up with the depression and he sort of felt like well you guys can make do you know just patch it up here and darn it over here you know you're gonna be okay all right my mom was like no they need to have proper clothes for school so they would have some fights over that and they were often you know violent unfortunately yeah um, uh, is just one example of the ways in which they didn't quite mesh, didn't quite get along. On the other hand, I really value the fact that I had both of those people with their different perspectives and, and postures and pivot points giving me direction and, and, and trying to uh, uh, help me explore or want to explore the world and feel free to do so. And one of the big things about my father being, having since he had been a motorcyclist, was he was he was a walker. He walked all everywhere all the time. We talked about that. Yes. Oh yeah, and he was and he was a fast walker. You know, I, I shouldn't pun and call him a race walker, but he was like, <laughs> <laughs> and he would tell my brothers, "Now you guys got to run, keep up with us, keep up with me. You got to run." And we were like, running to keep up with him, huh. right? And and uh, because he wanted us to look like we were always on doing something important. We had to be like, you're, you're about business here. You're, on time, on task. Yeah. On uh, mission. No slouching, no slumping, you know, you're, you're, you're serious, straight posture, blah, blah, blah. And, and, um, uh, and at the same time, he was always carrying a book. He was always mm. carrying a book. He always had CBC on, classical music, the news, uh, and so on. And so he modeled for me an intellectual. And I like to describe him as having been a working class intellectual. His conversation was always about politics, economics, history, art, movies, so on. A very, very serious person. I was, it wasn't until he was deceased that I realized he'd never finished high school. Mm. You know, so it's like, he was just so well read. And in his later life, his best friends were lawyers. Now, I, maybe I shouldn't say that too loud. <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, he loved the idea of being able to debate and argue mm -hmm. with, with, uh, with these gentlemen and and, and and position himself as their equal, mm -hmm. uh, so on, despite having only grade ten. Yeah. Um, and and uh, uh, my mom uh, was also uh, uh, really committed to nurturing our intelligence. She would take us on walks. She'd have us do art projects. And for me, she liked taking me to movies with her, which was great because it was one of those. It was one of those moments that was actually bonding moments between. She and I, uh, because my father had had some experimental ideas. <laughs> I kind of put it that way. He had a couple of experimental ideas, and one of them was that in order to ensure that I would grow up and be a he-man and ready to throw down, maybe become a boxer, or at least be able to defend myself and, well, and be, be tough. Sco Scotians, big history of boxing, so, they, okay. They, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Well, his, his methodology was to deny my mother the right to hold me when I was mm. an infant. Mm. She told me this you know, years later, mm -hmm. that uh, he would lock me up in a room, let me cry myself to sleep. I could not have that maternal affection from her because he was worried it would make me unmanly, in mm -hmm. quotation marks, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, whatever, you know, I think it was probably thinking he got from the back of a 1950s men's magazine. Mm -hmm. so, be sure you don't let your sons have any maternal affection. Yeah. Could be dangerous for them. 
or I could be a way too that he felt threatened that, you know, you were displacing uh, your mom's attention. Right? You're right. Yeah? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. But, but something fascinating, and I, I don't want it because your mother was very liberating at that time. And I mean, there's there's some things that I don't want to say because I want to say it in, in, in the book. But I know that when readers get to there, it's like, oh my gosh, is it RJ? Yeah, RJ. right, right, do, right, right. The story about RJ, <laughs> right? And uh, <laughs> oh, RJ could make your hormones young again. But what, but but what I, I found your mother very liberating, and and for me too, this was a telling moment in your mom's liberation uh, when she got further educated and she became the daycare director. And that changed the whole socioeconomics of your family. One of the things I was conscious in the book that right throughout the book, there's the theme, the theme of our economics of, 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 of black people. Uh, it reminded me a little, little bit for a moment there of Austin's argument in Sweet Food and Love or Pigtails and Breadfruit, whatever title you land on, where he looks at the culture of black women and their socioeconomical conditions to food. But right throughout your book, I keep coming back to the economics of our people, the economics of a family, the economics of a community. And if I hang out with even young bloods today, take them to basketball, anywhere, and, and you really pay attention to the conversation of, of young people, it's all about economics. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about how economics in some ways transform your family's life and probably led to the greater friction in your parents' lives. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and I talk about this, as you know, in, in, in the memoir, because I think it's really important, and, and it speaks to a lot of dynamics and, and conflicts um, internal to the community because of the pressure, economic pressure of white racism mm -hmm. upon employment opportunities uh, and class ascension, the possibility of class ascension. So the way that played out, especially in the post-slavery era, and I got to point out to people, I'm born 1960, but I'm, my great-grandfather was the son of former slaves, William Andrew White, born 1874. His parents had been slaves, right, in Virginia, enslaved persons in Virginia. So I'm only five generations from American slavery. Sitting right here right now in 2021, I'm only five generations away from American slavery. On Bathurst, and you're sitting on Bathurst, saying that. Yeah, saying it. this is good. Right? Yes. And, yes. And on my mother's side, um, our, part of our ancestors were uh, black uh, refugees from the War of 1812. So seven generations in Nova Scotia on my mother's side from, from that uh, emigration into, into colonial Nova Scotia. What I'm trying to get at here is that for those first generations of people, we gotta, we got to understand this. For those first generations of liberated black people just got out of slavery with nothing except the clothes on their backs. Nothing but that. That's all. And their own labor power, their own muscle power. That's it. That's all they got when they get landed in places like Nova Scotia and settled on the worst possible land. So what are they going to do? Where do they, what, what can they do? The most important thing for them, again, is to build a home and establish a community protection for their families, and then begin the long, arduous process of trying to build up wealth. Here it is, 2021, and only now are we beginning to have conversations about the economic impact of white privilege, mm -hmm. of how uh, the legacy of slavery has been that persons of European descent descended from slaveholders were able to continuously transfer wealth generation to generation. Mm -hmm. That was not possible for black people at all. Because all they could transfer really was poverty from generation to generation and illiteracy mm. going along, right along with it from generation to generation. So when we get down to my father's generation, which for him again is only three generations mm -hmm. outside of, of, of slavery, the impetus for him to prove that, that he was a successful black man was to be a father and a husband and have a home where he was the paterfamilias, where he was the patriarch, mm -hmm. and his wife was in his home under his control, mm -hmm. under his authority. And for black men like him at that point, 60, 70 years ago, that was a progressive model. They saw that as a progressive model. 
even though it was oppressive for women and children, they saw it as being progressive because they also knew of situations where uh, when black women had to work outside the home as maids, as nannies, as cooks, as domestics, that they would then become prey to potential sexual assault by their white employers mm -hmm. uh, or family members and so on. And mm -hmm. so it was a point of pride for black men on my street, Maynard Street, where I grew mm -hmm. up in Halifax, and most of the black men on my street worked for the railway. They Almost all of them did. And they all had nice homes. Mm -hmm. They all had a car. Mm -hmm. They all had their wives at home with their children. And they wanted it that way. As oppressive a model as it was, they saw that as being empowering mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. Because they knew that they they did not have that in their childhoods when, they were, when their mothers uh, or sisters or mm -hmm. others could become prey, economic prey of employers. So for them it was a point of pride, but at the same time, it was an oppressive patriarchal structure that they that they adhered to. So when my mother, when my mom <laughs> began to say, well, look, you know, I've got a teacher's college certificate. I know something about how to impart uh, uh, education to uh, young children, early childhood education. I'm an expert in it. Uh, and we've got a lot of children, black, white, brown, grid, yellow here in the north end of Halifax who desperately need to have this kind of nurturing, intellectual nurturing, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to receive government grants, I'm going to set up these daycares. And she did. And so this is the late 60s, 1970, 69, 70. She went to University, Carleton, you know, University of Ottawa, took some courses in early childhood education. She comes back to Halifax, she opens up these daycares. Two! Mm. And they're both still running, although one of them is running under a different name now, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, legacy, yeah. And she's the boss, and she's got a staff. People have to report to her, right? Mm. And she's got an office mm. with a desk. Mm. Crying aloud. I'm a kid. I'm ten years old. I'm coming to my mom's office. My mom's got an office. Their names on the desk, and she's sitting up there behind the desk for crying out loud, right? <laughs> and at the same time, that's true. There's my dad going out the door with the lunch uh, pail, going to work for the railway, basically doing the same kind of job he'd been doing for a long time. As a matter of fact, I didn't realize until this year, I didn't even put it in the memoir, I didn't realize until this year that for set, uh, no, uh, six, at least 16 years, he had been doing the same job at the Halifax train station from 1952 when he started to 1968. And that job was a humble job. It was uh, changing the linen on the over overnight train to and from Montreal and carrying luggage uh, from the trains, uh, to and from the trains, right? So he'd been doing the same job. Mm. As smart as he was, as, an, as intelligent as he was, he did other work too, mm -hmm. right? Again, to supplement the family income. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, I think that he felt really thwarted uh, uh, in, in having to accept to work in that kind of position at the, at the railway station. In the meantime, here's his wife. My, my, my dad is, is still a worker, right? Yes. And, and my mom's now a boss. Yeah, and, and in her economic dependence too is emerging increasingly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she's no longer dependent on, on him. She's got her own money. And also he had, he had forbidden her to learn how to drive. He had forbidden her because he didn't want her to have any kind of independence. She had to be totally uh, uh, secured in, in, in his domain, his castle, mm. right? But she secretly learned how to drive. And then she secretly bought a car, <laughs> a brand new car, 1972 Ford Comet Forest Green, right? Uh, uh, and a nifty, uh, sharp little car. Now, again, the contrast here with my father is he was a very economical person. So uh, he wasn't buying much anything that was new. If he could afford not to have to do it, he was not going for it. So here's my mom, who actually always did like, you know, new things and, and nice things and so on. Uh, she gets herself a new car, but she has to keep a secret, right? Because she knows it's going to be like dynamite dynamite in our in our household uh, and dynamite for the marriage 
Mm-hmm. But there was also other dynamite going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you mentioned RJ earlier, and and let's ties in with the economics of everything. I shouldn't give too much. No, away. no, no, no. We 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 we, we, we yeah we we're not we okay. we're not we're not we okay. can't tell them that All right. right? No, and and also right. too, you want to include that bit of, of of information that's not included in the book. So for those who are watching, make sure that you just exhaust this print run real fast so that they can have a new <laughs> reprint and George could insert some of this material that he just remembered. I forgot to put that in, but this is. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I want to go now to that the science project. I want to go to the science project. What was the name of the science project? Well, um, I can't remember what title I gave it. Now, it was like something that if you said it today, they would probably call you up and say you're a terrorist and oh, lock yeah. you up. Absolutely. Yeah. It was something you wanted to like blow up the whatever. Yeah, I want yes. to blow up Halifax. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, it was a yeah, because you know I grew up with the yeah. stories of the Halifax explosion, yeah. nineteen sixty, sorry, yeah. nineteen seventeen. Yeah, uh, the world's uh, biggest man-made explosion before the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Right. right. Yeah. And so I grew up with those stories and the photographs of the devastation of the North End and and all the images of of injured, wounded people and demolished uh, neighborhoods and and all that. And and of course I also knew about Hiroshima, mm-hmm. and so I. Uh, as a 15 year old decided I should do a project on how you would make an atomic bomb and where you would put it so you could <laughs> devastate all of Halifax yeah, this yeah. time. Could you imagine, <laughs> could you imagine like you putting that out there or like you write, write in Dare Rosemary, you know, Sadler, I'm thinking of this wonderful idea. I'd like you to collaborate with me. It's for a science fair at a junior school. Uh, you wouldn't even be sitting here. You both wouldn't even be on the planet right now, right? I, I, I just, yeah. you know, it's a good thing it was 1975 and not 1995 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's 500 pages. It's, it's, yeah. It's 500 pages long. Yeah, yeah. I had the schematic diagrams there. <laughs> because in those, in those days, you know, we didn't even have Wikipedia or anything, but all the information about how to make an atomic bomb was in encyclopedias. Yeah. It was easy to come by. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 so, so, so you created this the science project um, based on what was happening in the world and history in the world, or was this also to a commentary on the relationship of your parents and what that was leading to? You know, with the benefit of, of hindsight, uh, being 61, being able to look back. You're 61 now. I thought you were 16. <laughs> Shut up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, being able to look back over the life uh, and so on, I can say, you know, and I say it in the memoir, that my parents' breakup, which took a, a couple of years to actually be affected, uh, was extremely traumatic for me. Despite the fact that my father had been abusive uh, to all of us, uh, my mom and my two brothers, uh, despite that fact, I loved him very much, loved my mom very much. I respected and, and honored them both very much. And, and I really believed in them, as believed in us as a nuclear family intact. In no pun on nuclear, given my atomic bomb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Creativity. Yeah. But but uh, but it, is, it does come to that point about. I look back on that now, and I think that yeah, you know, one of the reasons why I was attracted to this idea of destruction is that I was seeing my family's, my parents splinter, and it was violent, and it was nasty, and it was long, and it was drawn out, and it was constant stress and turmoil. At least for me, I don't try to speak for my two brothers, um, who are only a year and two years younger than me. But I think you know they would likely have to agree that for all of us, it was a, it was a tremendous amount of stress. And at the same time, I'm coming into my adolescence. Hoorah! <laughs> right. Oh and, yeah. And uh, and trying to figure all that stuff out. And then I've got the two most important adults in my life. Just uh, um, you know going at each other uh, in the most horrendous ways possible and and both of them at the same time uh, showing their own uh, wounds and their own hurt and their own pain. More my mother than my father. He tended to be you know more of the hard rock time type of guy. It's like, well, I don't care. Da, 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 da. But I know he felt, he felt also the emotional turmoil. 
I, I love the fact that in, 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 in one sentence you simply said um, it was very moving to see my father cry. And, and, and when I got to that, you know, you think like, do men cry? Do black men cry? How often do you see black men cry? So I thought that too was pretty cool for you to, 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 to talk about that. Yeah, it was, it was uh, you know, my, my uh, uh, mom had just left him for the first time with us my brothers and I, and, and he came to call us back, and I could almost get emotional, but I won't, and, and, uh, yeah, um, you know, I was upstairs at my aunt's uh, place, and he was downstairs, and it was, and I described it as being like a high noon sun mm. in the memoir, but there he is, the sun on him, and it is roughly noontime, and he's looking up, and he's just crying, right, because of this, this devastating moment in, in uh, uh, their lives, my parents' lives, and, and therefore in all of ours, and, and so, and I, I was 12, and, and for the rest of, of that year, and certainly, you know, the next few years, uh, he became more of, of a diminished person. I don't mean that mm-hmm. in a negative way, I just mean that he, he was more human now, mm-hmm. just became more human, mm-hmm. more fallible. Definitely mm-hmm. more fallible mm-hmm. than I had ever thought of him uh, capable of being. Right throughout the, um, the, the the book, there is always this constant reference to music. While you were writing the book, what what music did you listen to? What was was those moments you're thinking, oh man, you know, this tune is just on point. I'm just flying across the page right now. What, what stimulated I, you, know, you through in this? Music I, uh, I think it's still true today for everybody uh, who's a teenager or, or close to it or, or what have it, what have you. I mean, as you're beginning to build these other relationships and love relationships with others, your peers and so on, or at least you want to or you're trying to, and so on, all of a sudden, Top 40 Radio or the songs that you and your peers are listening to become really important. They become the diary mm-hmm. for expressing your feelings. Mm-hmm. Um, even if you cannot really articulate them yourself. And so I, I remember those years, and, and, and suddenly there were a whole bunch of songs that just seemed to make sense. So you're mentioning Luther Ingram. If That's nothing it. is wrong, I don't yeah. want to be right. Of course, I was thinking about that and my father. <laughs> uh, but I was also thinking about my father and the Neil Young song. Uh, and I was thinking about myself, uh, old man, look at my life. I'm a lot like you. Or any, you know, in, in my 40s and 50s, I could say, yeah, wow, God, that's right. I am a lot like he was, although, although most of the bad part. Is like okay, okay. I'll, I'll just say very quickly, <laughs> you know, with full respect and honor uh, to him. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, there's and, some uh, disclaimers along the yeah, way, too, so, yeah, I noticed you have for the readers. <laughs> yeah, this is not me talking. <laughs> right? And, and also, um, Papa was a Rolling Stone. Mm. You know, that song mm-hmm. came out in the fall of 1972, mm-hmm. and when my father mm-hmm. left mm-hmm. our home for the first time, mm-hmm. right, um, yeah, as the marriage was breaking down, yeah. I saw him go to the door, and he had a little, a little tiny suitcase and a, and a hat. Mm-hmm. And I had never seen him look so so small before. Mm. You know, this giant was suddenly, you know, this this much smaller figure, mm. and I and I couldn't feel anything but great sorrow for him. Mm-hmm. And and in some ways, I wanted him to come back and and be. The dashing uh, uh, figure he had been, and an indomitable figure, you know, but th- that was gone. And that song spoke to it. I mean, the situations were different, but the narrative of that song was <laughs> but, like. But we're in the yeah. 60s, 70s, 80s period. Music is just pumping. I mean, hit after hit. Okay, no, no, uh, no disrespect. Hip hop in the new world that really. But you're sampling all of that stuff. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Today, and I'm like, oh, you call it old school, but hey, you're playing it every time that I see you go by. Oh, no, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like the thin line between love and hate. Yeah, that was one of my mom's records. Yeah, yeah, and I saw the movie. Oh my god, it was it 20 years ago now? Something like 25 years? I shouldn't say 25 years ago, but anyway, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. So those those songs really spoke to reality. I mean, not to mention James Brown for crying out loud is another one of my mom's favorites. And of course, Millie Jackson records that mm-hmm. the, that people would play, women would play, especially that were meant to be hidden messages to the guys in their lives, yeah. like stop messing around, yeah. stop fooling around, blah 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 blah. 
Um, and uh, all of a sudden, I think of Betty Wright, the cleanup woman. Mm, yeah. <laughs> My mother played that on Sundays. Yeah, I don't know why, but <laughs> she did. That, that came like the rotation oh, yeah, uh, uh, on Sundays. I think it's because I recently saw the film on Aretha. The mm. whole time when I read the book, I was thinking R E S B C D. You know, the whole, you know, right through the book. Uh, I, I was thinking that. Uh, our audience, I'm sure that they're thinking, how is it that George Eliot Clark could be speaking about a book and not reading from it, right? I'm sure that they're thinking, like, oh, I had to shut up. But so what I what I'd like to do is to have um, this opportunity for you to read an excerpt from your book. And then I am really, really curious and really interested to also speak about Rocky Jones, oh right? Uh, Walter Borden, the first time I heard Walter Borden is God's trombone. Yep. Oh my thought, I thought I was, I had heard God himself. I mean, the, the, the guy is something else. Um, Sylvia Hamilton, all these people, and to bring it home, I'm very happy that you've put Dudley Laws in your book so that we know these exceptional people uh, who do extraordinary things on ordinary days? Yeah. So, uh, um, so I'd like if you want to to, to read uh, from the book right now. And for those who are tuning in and thinking, "Oh my God, this is so fabulous, cool!" We are at the People's Residence, seven 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 Bathurst Street, a different bookless cultural center. Um, I just said do, and I'm in conversation with the man that you just don't say one name to, but you say all three. <laughs> George Eliot Clark, and that would be Clark with an E. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's it. And I'm sorry, I should just read this little this little bit about coming to Toronto. There was an excerpt recently nice. uh, in the Toronto Star. Uh, and and so uh, uh, here it is. And, and Rocky is central to this. Nice. So, one April morning in 1978, I was sitting in my father's kitchen spooning cereal and preparing for school when the phone rang. It was Rocky. Yep. And uh, he had an extra ticket for a flight to Toronto. I was 18, an adult, <laughs> according to Revenue Canada and to the law. <laughs> but I still asked Bill's uh, permission to leave to skip school and fly to Toronto with Rocky and his daughter, Tracy. Well, about 30 minutes later, Rocky pulled up in his red Jeep, and then we were up, up, and away to Toronto, the good, hog town, the big smoke, the six, the big crab apple. Not used to travel. I didn't pack proper clothes to address the April chill. Rocky didn't hesitate. Just took off his own jacket and put it around my skinny shoulders, his mantle upon my back. The man was unfailingly generous always. The jacket was gray or beige with small black checks. I wore it proudly for years, slowly growing into it as my political consciousness too slowly. <laughs> Once we landed and eventually took the subway somewhere, I revealed myself to be a Haligonian hick by boarding the subway car and hollering, Hey everyone, I'm from Nova Scotia! <laughs> I screamed when I read that. I can see it too! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was I ever properly silenced by the stony looks the other subway riders hurled my way? If they thought, here's another half ass Haligonian half breed come to suck up our welfare and her bunk, I couldn't have been a couple years later as I exited the humongous discount bazaar of Honest X at Bathurst and Bloor with a backpack stuffed with eternally creased polyester and for a fragile cutlery. An older black woman spying my life with my shoddy, shabby purchases. Well, you must be from Nova Scotia. Call and response. Yeah. <laughs> Call and response. Well, <laughs> Rocky had flown us, Tracy and I, to Toronto to participate in a meeting of the Black Youth Community Action Project, BICAP, mm. which was stewarded by Dudley Laws. Laws was a black elder who sported the Black Panther-style black beret right rakishly, and who organized the Black Action Defense Committee in the early 1980s to protest white cop aggression, often lethal, against unarmed black Torontonians. He had the smooth, suave, licorice complexion of our day, 
and also hailed from Jamaica, but Laws was tutored in Malcolm X, not Penthouse, was devoted to liberation, <laughs> not pardoning. He spoke softly but radiated grace, mm. charisma as a cognate of charm mm. under pressure. By cap with the support of Laws and a bespectacled, tan complected elder who seemed to speak through his teeth, namely Ed Clark of the Black Resource Information Center, was that April weekend holding a youth conference. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to jump in here just a little bit so I can talk about uh, mm -hmm. some of the uh, uh, scenes. Can of people talk conference. about that conference, George, to this day? And gatherings as an, an anecdotal, you know? So, so I'm, I'm very happy that this is now recorded into history. Yes, in your book. It was it was amazing. Yeah. I met a, a lot of people there uh, uh, who I maintain contact with over the years. Uh, Louis, I'm going to forget Louis' surname. I can still see his face playing his stand. Mm -hmm. I've him a few times mm -hmm. uh, since uh, in the community. Dion Brand, yes. of course. Yeah. And, and, uh, and others as well who mm -hmm. I would see whenever I would be passing through. And these people were serious Garveyites. Yeah. So, so, so this is a very exciting time at the same time. Yeah, and of course I had I did my little piece of blasphemy versus the UNIA uh, hall and the and the chair that Garvey had uh, that was roped off to represent the fact that he. And this had, is the UNIA on College Street. UNIA on College Street. Right behind the audience, behind me is the slab and the cement which says UNIA right here, right in the window. And it comes from that building oh on God. College Street. Oh so you're, you're sitting next to that history right now. We're yeah. just custodians of it. Yes. And so i got, I got to read this passage because it has to do with Third World Books. Right? So, I soon made my way to Third World Books, that shrine to black literature. I didn't have much money, but the priceless works went dirt cheap. A few red pamphlets and black poetry booklets were a buck each. Everything I bought was treasure. Carolyn Rogers, the stone soul boss. Dudley Randall, who got me reading Pushkin. Angela Jackson, Southern Fried Eroticism. All titles from Third World Press, Chicago, mm. or Paul Bremen, London. Now I had drums in my ears, poems in my head. Folks trying to initiate a black culture and consciousness revolution in Toronto. Only a decade late after the U.S. movements, yet they were right on time for Canada. I mean, what Canadians could possibly be ready for in this de facto red Tory state? <laughs> One of our meetings that weekend occurred in the Universal Negro Improvement Association Hall on College, about halfway between Spadina and Bathurst. I eyed the gold tasseled, roped off crimson yeah. velvet <laughs> chair that had once cradled the touch of Marcus Mosiah Garvey, whose thing. middle name I pinched for my triple barrel nom de plume, and who had now the UNIA, the greatest global organization of black people that has ever existed. Harlem was the HQ, but branches could be found in Europe, Canada, the Caribbean, and Africa. When no one was about, I plunked my own bottom on His Excellency's <laughs> sanctified seat. But experience neither epiphany nor blasphemy, just a sense of history. And I'll just read one more one more passage about Toronto uh, in those days. That weekend also introed me to the Underground Railroad Soul Food Restaurant, mm. home of barbecued ribs <laughs> and sweet potato pie, which I wouldn't fork again until living in North Carolina in the mid 1990s, and to friends where I was partial to rice pudding. The cookery in Toronto's air around Kensington Market and Spadina and Bathurst was competitive <laughs> with the seaside aromas of Halifax. Every breath was to trek Marco Polo's silk road <laughs> <laughs> or to anchor in a Caribbean isle, leeward or windward, <laughs> or to shuttle through Europe from brick themed pubs to Iron Curtain vodka, Resonant were East Indian and West Indian mashups of curry and samosas and doubles, plus the Aeolian, Tyrrhenian, and Mediterranean black and Aegean seas, plus the Tex-Mex mm. Cajun food, music corridor, Houston, New Orleans, plus the array of Argentinian beef and Brazilian hog, plus spicy dishes out of Sichuan or Vietnam, thanks to resettled so-called boat people. Anyway, Toronto's mutually consented to Coitus of cultures creates 
beautiful bastardizations or creolizations, a Greek and Chinese restaurant, an Italian and Jamaican restaurant, all's possible. <laughs> this bastion of Apollonian multiculturalism, a feast for the belly and a fiesta for the bedroom. Multiculturalism mandates cosmopolitan canoodling. Amen. <laughs> Thank God you came to Toronto, right? Fantastic, George. And maybe my final question to you. When you think of Rocky, mm. you think of Walter, and, and I should say their names because we're not just speaking with each other. When we, we, we think of Rocky Jones and we think of the Dudley Laws, um, I'm glad that you you also evoked Ed Clark's name. You know, these are these are names people talk about in their families. But now we are talking it about it in a public domain to Canadians. It's documented in the book. And for the high school students who will be reading this book and putting on their course list and studying the book and looking at Canadian history and Scotian history and all of the above thing, uh, this is a wonderful moment for you to claim or reclaim the names of these individuals who are game changers and who really impacted all Canadians in the society. And then there's a Sylvia Hamilton's. But my point in all of this, you speak about the people, um, some of them who were pragmatic in their approach, some of them who were very idealistic in their approach, some of them who came with all that revolution uh, fervor in their approach. Today we are on the left. We are coming from so many places to address common issues. Sometimes it is people feel it is difficult to disagree, to have different opinions. In offering up this menu of people who are coming from different walks of life with different perspectives but towards a common goal, what is it that we can take from their examples or what you experienced with them that we can use in this time as we wrestle with how we move our, the left forward, more progressive politics forward, or to do the right thing? That is a great question. Here we are in the people's residence, this cultural hub, uh, this bookstore, uh, this assembly <laughs> of tomes that are, that are all about increasing consciousness and improving conscience and self-knowledge and knowledge of history and society and so on. And I want to begin here uh, with, th with that um, uh, uh, eulogy, so to speak, uh, for, for uh, the brilliance of this space and, and all the authors represented here and all the other cultural workers represented here. Because when I think about Rocky and Joan, his then wife, mm -hmm. Joan Jones, who's actually from Oakville, by the way, and she was the one who got Rocky reading. Because the thing was, her father, who was uh, Joan Jones's father, uh, Joan uh, uh, Bonner was her was her birth name. So when she was Joan Bonner, her father was working for the railway, and he didn't like Rocky coming around dating uh, Joan. He was ignorant, didn't know any history, didn't know any politics, didn't know any culture. So the thing was, and Joan was down with that. She was saying, "You cannot be dating me until you have read. You have read." Du Bois, you have read Fanon, you have read all of the all of the historians that they had access to, uh, Black American history, uh, the Garveyite materials, and so on. So she got Rocky reading because Rocky was was more into the hanging out, going to the pool halls and the car washes and all the rest. And he's got a great autobiography as well, mm -hmm. where he talks about all this and, and how he got educated. So, but I, I come back centrally to answering this last question. So when I think about Rocky, I think about Joan, I think about Walter Borden, uh, uh, the great uh, poet, playwright, actor, mm -hmm. uh, newspaper editor, as mm -hmm. he was at mm -hmm. one point, uh, and, and then Sylvia Hamilton, who's now a, a filmmaker of, of much renown, a poet herself, and, and uh, her husband, Bev Greenlaw, who was uh, a basketball coach, now retired, uh, and even though uh, he was involved in university athletics, Bev... Well, also had a community orientation um, 
and was very much a grounded, uh, organic intellectual. And then the, the other person I have to mention who was white, is white, uh, still very much with us happily, Jackie Barkley, who's originally from the United States, uh, was a communist. Da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. I don't think she mind me saying that. I think she's, you know, she's uh, quite happy about that uh, uh, political uh, background that she had when I first uh, met her in 1978. And together, uh, you know, here's Jackie, who's from the far left uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, side of things. Then you have Rocky, who was more, uh, somewhat more pragmatic, but also radical. And and uh, and then Sylvia, who's certainly feminist and progressive in, in her politics. And Bev, who was quietly progressive in, in everything. And 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 Walt Walt was was uh, definitely uh, Egyptologist. Uh, black nationalist, uh, Afrocentric, yeah. uh, the yin yang. Yeah, and right? he was also a brave man because back then he was also LGBTQ, and back then too, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I t- to be discriminated against. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So uh, together, these these six people were my brain trust, mm. and what they did for me between the ages of seventeen and nineteen is that they educated me, and that's the most important thing I can impart to anybody. Uh, young anybody who who is interested in in what to do on how to improve things how to make a difference how to be an activist an effective activist uh, you got to go to school you got to read you got you know not just not just do the text in not just look up stuff on Wikipedia you got to read you got you got to go to work got to get down in the books I mean I remember when I'm 17 18 uh, uh, Rocky jo- look at the Joneses home on Winter Street in Halifax, it was nothing but a, a it was a, it was a cultural symposium all the time, all the time. Curry on the on the table, wine in the fridge, and sometimes on the table, sometimes in my belly, uh, and 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 then books, records. Oh my golly! You know, I had that was the first house I'd ever been in where there was a room that was dedicated to a library. You know, a, a, a library. You know, I got a little library in my house now, you know, because I just think it's so cool. You got to have a library and you can have like a secret bookcase or whatever. And COVID has shown how it's important. <laughs> Everybody who comes on TV have a library behind them, right? Exactly. There you go. <laughs> exactly, right? So, yes. So I would go over there and I would, I would spend the night and basically just hanging out in the library, reading, 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 playing the records that they had, their last poets especially, Bob Dylan stuff. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then Walter and I would sit around and talk, or Joan would give me lessons on things, and Rocky would say, "You know, I want to think about this, think about that." And and um, it was just a it was a, a great university level education that these six people provided me. I was working downtown, and I'd be walking home to my to my tiny, tiny one room apartment. I can't even tell how tiny it was. No, I've had a tiny apartment. Like my my television was like you could hold it in my hand. People would come and say, "Where's the TV?" And I go, "It's in my hand." We got to watch it together like that. We couldn't do a COVID watching my TV. (laughs) Right here, I had I put my books in the oven because there's no place else to put it. Mm. (laughs) Mm. Some of them, anyway. Some on the stereo was on top of the fridge. And and uh, uh, the bed was right up against the closet, mm. and and my I had a window, and the window was right in front of a street light. So so uh, yeah, it was and I, and the only chair I had was a bar stool, because nothing else was going to work in that in that tiny space. But anyway, walking back up to that to that uh, um, my abode, um, I would often be like really cold, and I just didn't feel like making the making the twenty minute thirty minute trek. And so I'd, I'd walk by Bev and Sylvia's, and I'd knock on the door, you know, late at night, 10, 11 o'clock at night. I'd be, like, in the office typing up poetry. And then I'd say, oh, i got to walk all the way back up to there. Oh, geez, let me knock on Bev and Sylvia's door. they got to take pity on me. And sure enough, they open the door and come on in. You know, you can have, uh, we'll throw some quilts down on the floor. You make a bed for yourself there. Make it, pour you some tea. Sylvia would get the tea going. Bev would open up a beer for me. Thank you, Bev. <laughs> <laughs> and then we would sit around and we would talk. We would talk for hours, politics, mm-hmm. history, mm-hmm. records, uh, films, and so on, right? And then I, I, 
end up getting up next morning, have a little bit of breakfast with them, and then finish my, my walk back up to my, my room. And, and uh, but, you know, I, I got to end up, and I'll just say this. The greatest gift that they could give me, and it was Rocky uh, and Joan who forced me to go to university. They forced me. I, had, I was too afraid. I really was. I didn't have the money, so Joan gave me a job. I was, I was, I was certain everybody was smarter than me. That I, I would not be able to survive uh, the rigors of a university education. And Joan said to me something I passed on to my own daughter. And she said, whenever you think you know the answer to a question, you put your hand up. I'll never forget that. So you put your hand up. So I started to do that all the time. I know the answer. I know the answer. I know the answer. <laughs> and everybody in the room was like angry at me because they didn't know the answer. Well, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then I started to feel good about about being an intellectual. You know, I, I think I got to end up with with this. Uh, yes, I'm a poet. I'm a scholar, and, and so on. But I wouldn't be any of those things if I were not an intellectual, also. And I and I say this to my creative writing students. Every writer is an intellectual. Every writer is an intellectual. Whether you want to be that or not, whether you think of yourself being an intellectual or not, that's exactly what you are. And you should own it and be proud of it. Because you give me an organization of intellectuals, you can do anything. You can overturn anything. Nothing wrong with it. You become a historian. You become the cultural expert. You become the talking head. You are the expert. And nobody can talk anything or about you or against you or around you because you can put them in their place. You know, I, 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 I won't give away any names here. I'm not going to mention anything, but I will share one last anecdote. Uh, so uh, so I, I've become a professor of teaching at Duke, which brings me to the attention of U of T. Uh, they decide to hire me from Duke, so I come back from Durham, North Carolina to Toronto, 1999. And I start really exploring, furthering uh, the development of the study of African Canadian literature, because that's really what I have done in the academy, is created as a field of study, mm -hmm. and and uh, and that's been recognized all all over the place, including um, a stint at Harvard, Harvard, excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, 2013, 2014. I was so shocked when they when they sent me couriered me a contract saying, "Why don't you come here and teach?" And I and I was I, I was so astonished. Harvard. But you did put your hand up. I put my hand right. up. Right. Yeah, I went. <laughs> and and uh, but I didn't ask why they chose me until I got there. Just in case they said, Oh, we thought you th we thought you were that other clerk. <laughs> <laughs> so I kept it quiet for three years until I, until I got there. Then I say, Oh, but why so, okay, now that I'm here why me? Um, yeah, why why did you choose me? It's because we we like your writing. We like your research. Mm. Okay, that's that's pretty good. So, but I keep getting away from coming to the conclusion. So here it is, uh, the anecdote. So I've I've done all this academic work and so on, and published a bunch of essays <laughs> and reviews and scholarly conferences and blah blah blah. blah. And I'm sitting in my office, and in 2005, a gentleman comes to visit me, who's black, and he sits across from my from my desk. At, the, my, at my office, U of T, and he begins to tell me how worthless my research is. And he begins to tell me how my research cannot help anybody who's walking on Godigan Street in Halifax trying to find a job. And, and that everything I've done is just pointless because uh, it's true, I, I can't get somebody hired, you know, just like that. I can't. Um, and nothing I write is necessarily going to put food on somebody else's table. Um, or make somebody else um, materially better off. I admit that, and and so on. And I understood the point that he was making. Um, so as he sat there telling me how worthless my scholarship was, I started to laugh. And it was one of those big belly laughs that, like, my mom would have had, or my aunt would have had, or my grandmother would have had. Um, and like, just I, cause I, I just suddenly realized how wrong he was, you know, to making the, these statements. And, and so I laughed and laughed and laughed, and I'm sure he felt a little bit uncomfortable as I was laughing at his, at his uh, critique. And then I said, let me tell you something, my friend. You're sitting in my office at the University of Toronto, across from me at my desk. 
And I'm going to admit to you that, yes, none of the research I do is going to help anybody necessarily. But you need to understand where I'm from and why I, do not, why I have never felt that my research separates me from my community. Because I know who I am, I know where I'm from. And when I received my PhD, when I achieved my doctorate in, and received it in the fall of 1993, I did not have a job. No one was offering me a job. I didn't have any, any uh, uh, offers uh, coming to me to come and teach here or become a sessional over there. Nothing. Uh, my phone wasn't ringing, as I like to say. No one was calling. No one seemed to be interested. But my community said, Georgie Clark is now Dr. Clark. Mm -hmm. And they threw a community mm -hmm. celebration in the north end of Halifax on a freezing cold Saturday night in January 1994 when I still did not have a job. All I had was a DR in front of my name and a PhD after it. And they came out, about 100 people, on a freezing cold Saturday night. And they put my face up on posters all around the north end of Halifax. Come and meet Dr. George Elliott Clark. Mm -hmm. You know, when I have that in my background, when I have that kind of support in my background, no. You're not going to come and tell me that my work isn't important. My work answers back to all of the racist scholarship and research that was done for centuries about us. About us, African Nova Scotians, Africadians, black people in general. So I become one of the first who's able to answer back and say, no, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. You misunderstood this, misunderstood that, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my job in the academy is to correct the errors and to inform others of what they need to know in order to feel confident, in order to feel pride, in order to understand our history. That is a glorious history in order to have material to write about. As I was saying before, you know, you, I come from a community where people just make somebody a saint. And you know what? I'm going to say, look, it, when my time comes, think about me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Saint Georgia. I'm down with that. Okay. Yeah, you don't even have to wait. No, you can just do it now. This is the great world that we live in, you know? <laughs> George Elliott Clark, I, I, I just want to thank you uh, for coming to the People's Residence and sharing your life, your formative years with us, uh, sharing your parents with us. Um, as the son of Jerry and Will and, and Bill, and now I, I'm familiar with them, um, you know, thank you for even taking us to some of their most secret places of, of the, their lives. And most importantly, thank you too for including those voices, people who every day do things that just make the society, the world a different place. People with vision who not only act for the moment, but to see years ahead. So I am just very, very thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with you. I haven't seen you for a little time, but who has seen anybody for a little time? Anyway, but I'm happy that we could do this in person. And any time that we are struggling with notions of beauty, and it seems to me when I read the book and even listening to you, as a member of the Clark family, you also too were the chronicler of the Clark family because you always seem to observe your family and be outside of the family observing them. And, and in so doing, this, you have given us now this new body of work. Yes, people are going out there. People go out there and buy that because, you know, we got to get the print run because George has thought some other things that we need to include <laughs> it. But what we do know from George, that this is just his formative years, the 60s into the 80s. And we know that right now on his way home or in the subway or in the taxi, he's beginning maybe the forward or the first chapter of the next segment of his life. Enough respect, George. Keep in good health. And we will continue to promote where beauty survived by George Eliot Clark, an Africadian memoir. Enough respect. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you. <laughs>